Um, right, so I started my lab at Princeton a couple years ago. And um, the focus of my lab is on innate behavior. And as I'm sure you know, innate behaviors play a critical role in the lives of all animals. For example, uh, they help us find food and avoid predators. They help us secure mates and also care for our offspring. So considering the important role innate behaviors play in all of these basic life functions, it's no surprise that when animals adapt to new environments, their behavior often changes. And in fact, behaviors are often some of the first traits to change during adaptation, and they can play a critical role in the evolution of new species. Now the goal of my lab is to take advantage of these evolutionary shifts to understand how behaviors are controlled by genes and neurons. So for example, how do genes specify the structure and activity of neural circuits in the brain, and how do these circuits um, generate appropriate and adaptive behavioral responses to sensory information? Now one very common and successful way in which people address these questions is to artificially perturb genes and neurons and study the effects of those perturbations. So for example, we can silence a gene of interest, uh, knock out a gene or silence a neuron. I'm not used to pressing buttons on the computer. Um, and look to see how these changes, these knockouts, silencing events, um, affect circuit activity and behavioral output. <coughs> now in my lab, we take a complementary approach, which is instead of to generate artificial perturbations of genes and neurons, is to rely on natural perturbations that have accumulated over the course of evolution. So for example, if we can identify two closely related populations that differ in a behavior of interest, we know their genomes must contain key differences in genes that regulate that behavior. So if we can map those differences, we can then um, identify a set of genes that affect a specific behavior and also study the mechanisms by which those genes affects beha affect behavior. I think that studying behavioral evolution in this way um, is a relatively untapped resource for identifying basic links between genes, neurons, and behavior. Um, and it's untapped because there are very few studies um, of the genetic basis of behavioral changes. This is a summary of a literature review published a few years ago in which the authors cataloged all cases they could, they could find where researchers had convincingly linked changes in a specific gene to a change um, in any type of trait behavioral, morphological, or physiological. And as you can see, out of over 1,000 examples, only 18 um, underlied behavioral traits versus hundreds of genetic changes that were associated with morphological or physiological evolution. So we really know very little about the genetic changes that underlie behavioral evolution and even less about the mechanisms through which those changes affect behavior. Now, as a model for studying these changes, <clears throat> we use mosquitoes. And we do this for three reasons. Um, first, they're tractable laboratory organisms. They're easy to rear, at least the species that we study. Uh, they have short generation times. They're genetically manipulable. And they um, exhibit uh, an array of very interesting and highly robust behaviors that can be reproduced in the lab. Second, and importantly for our research program, um, they show uh, a wide array of fascinating, recent, and rapid evolutionary changes in behavior. And thirdly, these changes have very important implications for human health. So some of you may know that uh, mosquito bites are actually the most dangerous interactions that we can have with any animal on the planet, including with ourselves. Um, mosquito bites cause diseases that kill almost a million people every year. And I think it's really hard for us in the developed world to conceptualize that, um, how dangerous a mosquito bite can, mos mosquito bite can be um, although that's changing a little bit right now, at least in North America, if you're a pregnant woman in South Florida, um, you're terrified of getting a mosquito bite right now, and for good reason. So mosquito bites are really something to be feared, and what's interesting about um, the mosquitoes that transmit human diseases is that they're not a random sample of all mosquitoes. So there are actually about 3,000 species of mosquitoes worldwide, and it's only a very small handful that contribute the vast majority of these human deaths. And what sets that handful of species apart is that they've recently and rapidly evolved to specifically target human hosts. So the two quintessential examples of this are the African malaria mosquito, Anopheles gambi, which is a human specialist, and also the species that we study, um, Aedes aegypti, 
This is called the yellow fever mosquito, the dengue fever mosquito, now it's called the Zika mosquito, because it's the major vector of all three of those diseases, as well as a virus called chikungunya virus. This mosquito um, is distributed, as you can see on this map, throughout the subtropics and tropics, um, but it almost certainly originated as a wild species living in, living in forested areas of sub-Saharan Africa. And today in sub-Saharan Africa, you can still find populations of, the, of this mosquito that live in the forest, away from humans, and bite non-human animals. Outside of Africa, the story is very different. These populations are genetically and ecologically homogenous. They're all strictly specialized on living with and biting humans. And they probably descended from a single population that evolved to specialize in biting humans sometime within the past 10,000 years, and then spread around the world with our help. Now these two forms of the dengue fever mosquito um, are currently described as distinct subspecies, um, and they have slightly different body colors reflected in the colors I've chosen to use on this range map. So non-African human-adapted mosquitoes tend to be lighter brown, and African mosquitoes, which, as I mentioned, are sometimes wild and non-human adapted, but also sometimes live in cities and bite humans, they tend to be uh, darker black in body color. Now, there's only one place in the world where these two subspecies coexist, and that's along the coast of East Africa, most likely due to a reintroduction of non-African mosquitoes through Arab trade over the past 2,000 years. So these populations of domestic, um, non-African-derived mosquitoes in East Africa are um, clearly distinct and clearly more closely related to non-African populations than they are to their neighbors um, there in Africa. These were first identified um, by researchers working in this village of Rabai in Kenya in um, the 1960s uh, and 70s. I took this picture in Rabai in 2009. Um, and researchers working in this area found black mosquitoes of what they called a forest form breeding in tree holes in the forest. And they found brown mosquitoes of what they called a domestic form breeding exclusively in earthenware pots people use to store water inside their homes. And so as you can see in the picture, these two habitats are very close to each other um, in close geographic proximity. In fact, you could find forest mosquitoes directly out, outside a house. You don't actually even have to go into the forest to find a forest mosquito. So they're living in close proximity. In the laboratory, they were fully reproductively compatible. And yet, in the wild, they maintained these interesting ecological differences. And importantly, uh, domestic mosquitoes showed an array of novel behaviors that helped them find and bite human hosts. For example, they'd evolved a um, propensity to fly inside homes. It's not clear what stimulus that was based on. Um, they prefer to lay their, lay their eggs in these large earthenware pots that are located inside homes, and they showed a strong preference for biting humans. So I first read about this um, at the end of graduate school, and I became excited about it as a, as a potential study system and decided to join Leslie Bosshaus' lab at the Rockefeller in order to reestablish the system um, for modern study. Now, the last time these populations had been described and published on was uh, in the late 1970s, so it had been about 30 years. We didn't know if they still existed uh, in this area of Africa, so the first job was to go back um, and see if we could collect these mosquitoes, bring them into the lab, and confirm the behavioral differences that had been described previously. So I um, established a collaboration with researchers at the Kenya Medical Research Institute in Nairobi, uh, and we traveled to this area of Rabai, Kenya. We're only about 20 kilometers here from the Indian Ocean, very close to the port city of Mombasa. You can see this river here, um, and along the river, uh, forests have been preserved. This is the habitat of the forest mosquito. These forests are sacred to the local people and therefore have not been cut down. Um, and then here, west of the forest, you see village habitat. Really everywhere else, there are village habitats, um, but particularly in the 70s, research researchers described uh, domestic mosquitoes living in these villages. That picture I showed you before was taken exactly from this spot looking uh, southeast towards these forests. So we decided to um, collect mosquitoes both indoors and outdoors, and these icons show all the locations where we found this particular species of mosquito. Outdoors, uh, the green tree icons, and indoors, the house icons. With these um, collections, I returned to New York and established 30, almost 30 laboratory colonies where each colony was descended from a small number of males or females collected in exactly the same house or exactly the same tree hole. 
And it soon became clear while breeding these laboratory colonies and establishing them that while the vast majority of these collections yielded black mosquitoes, um, individuals collected uh, in this small group of homes and this single home up here yielded brown mosquitoes. So it was looking good so far. It looked like you, these two types of mosquitoes did still coexist, although we had yet to establish that they differed in uh, behavior. And so the easiest way we could think of um, to test their host preference was to simply put females in a large cage with an anesthetized guinea pig uh, and a human arm and ask how many bite the guinea pig, how many bite the human arm. Um, so this is a very crude um, assay. I'll uh, present the results in terms of a preference index where one means all the mosquitoes that bit a host bit the human, negative one means all the mosquitoes that bit a host bit the guinea pig, zero is 50-50. It doesn't take into account mosquitoes that didn't bite either host. Okay, and you can see that um, there was a highly significant difference between brown and black mosquitoes, but the preference of brown mosquitoes for humans was uh, weak at best. Essentially, they, they displayed no preference. Now, one thing about this assay is that the mosquitoes are exposed not only to the olfactory cues, which, upon which we think host preference is primarily based, but also to visual cues. Um, and in general, we know that mosquitoes are attracted to visual contrast. So you would expect the, the guinea pig in this assay, since I'm Caucasian, to um, provide much more visual contrast and therefore vi be visually more attractive to these mosquitoes. So that's a hypothesis, but we at least wanted to take visual cues out of the picture and isolate the effect of olfactory cues on preference. And so the first way that we did that was using this live host olfactometer assay. Um, it's a large box, put 50 to 100 female mosquitoes in the box, turn on a fan at the exhaust end of the box that actually pulls air over live human and live guinea pig hosts into these traps and then into the box. So when the air is turned on, mosquitoes can choose to fly upwind towards human odor or towards guinea pig odor. And this is what this looks like from um, the perspective of the investigator. And as you can see here, um, the preference of domestic or brown mosquitoes for humans in this assay, where olfactory cues are more or less isolated, was very strong. The first time I ran this assay was an extremely exciting day in the lab. I think I tested 100 female mosquitoes, and 99 of them chose the human, and one of them chose the guinea pig. So over and over again, when we get mosquitoes from non-African populations and from these domestic populations in East Africa, they show overwhelming and very robust preferences for human odor over any other animal that we've tested so far, including um, chickens, mice, cows, horses, um, a few other things. So we use guinea pigs as our standard um, laboratory test for preference, but we do know that this, chain, this difference in preference applies to other animals as well. We also uh, conducted an assay that I don't have time to show you, but consists of replacing the live hosts with sections of nylon pantyhose that have been worn on a human arm or on a guinea pig torso for 24 hours and picked up that odor. Then we can add to that host-specific odor controlled amounts of carbon dioxide, whereas in this assay, uh, we can't control how much carbon dioxide is being give, given off by the two hosts. So when we control that, we also see the same difference in preference. So we know that this preference is based on a specific response to species-specific host cues and not to a general difference, for example, in the amount of carbon dioxide in our breath. So within the past 10,000 years, these domestic mosquitoes have evolved this very striking and robust preference for human odor. And, uh, we were able to still find these populations, they still exist, bring them into the lab, um, and establish uh, that they continue to, to differ in preference. So then the really fascinating question for me arises, how is this difference encoded in the genome and in the brain, olfactory centers in the brain, of these domestic mosquitoes? You know, what's different about these things that makes domestic mosquitoes all of a sudden go crazy about human odor? Um, I forgot to present this, but I think it's important. So let me point out that although I previously showed you data on host preference, the total response rate of these different types of mosquitoes also um, is different with domestic mosquitoes responding at high rates and forest mosquitoes responding at relatively low rates. And that when you add these two um, variables together, you see these very discrete behavioral clusters. These things are truly two different things. And the behavior of domestic mosquitoes here in Kenya um, exactly reflects the behavior of a non-African population from Thailand. And the behavior of these forest mosquitoes from Kenya exactly reflects 
uh, the behavior of other African populations, other East African populations, for example, in Uganda. So how is this difference encoded in the genome and in the brain of mosquitoes? Well, host odors, um, animal odors in general, as many of you probably know, are not made up of just single compounds, but are complex blends of many individual odorants. This is a partial gas chromatography trace of human odor showing just some of the over 100 components um, that make up human odor. And some of these compounds are shared with guinea pig odor, and others are more or less host-specific. So presumably, domestic mosquitoes are, are queuing in on some subset of these host-specific compounds to help them distinguish humans from other animals. Um, I should also say that, in general, animal odorants are fairly generic. There's no single component of human odor that is only found in human odor. So mosquitoes must tell us apart um, by the blend of components, blend of compounds they found in human odor, um, specific blend and their relative ratios. So how can mosquitoes do this? Um, the main olfactory organ of the mosquito is the antenna, although they also can smell um, with these organs, the maxillary palp. These sensory organs, like the antenna, are covered um, in, with hollow cuticular hairs called sensilla that house the dendrites of olfactory sensory neurons. So in this schematic of a single sensory hair, you can see it houses the dendrites of two sensory neurons here in two different shades of gray. Each of these sensory neurons will express a specific odorant receptor um, that determines what odors that neuron will respond to. So one possibility is that the tuning of these sensory neurons on the olfactory organs of the mosquito has evolved to make them more sensitive, for example, to attractants in human odor or less sensitive to aversive compounds in human odor. From the antenna, olfactory information is carried to several different processing centers in the brain. And it, we don't know exactly how this works, but circuits in these areas must integrate information about the individual components of human odor to generate a host percept. And so another possibility is that the way these central olfactory circuits integrate information about individual odorants has changed so that the host percept of these mosquitoes now corresponds to the particular blend of odorants found in human odor. Okay, so the changes may be peripheral, they may be central, or perhaps most likely a combination of the two. Now, obviously, it's most tractable to look for peripheral changes, so that's where we started. And in particular, we decided um, to do an RNA-seq comparison of antennal gene expression, starting in domestic and forest colonies, using these six colonies that differed um, in their response to host odors trapped on nylon sleeves. Here I'm showing you average expression of all annotated genes in the genome um, in antennae for these three forest colonies. Here's average expression for these three domestic colonies. You can see that in general, most dots, most genes um, are expressed at about the same level in the two groups and fall along the one-to-one -one line. But there's actually also quite a bit of scatter away from this line. And with a fairly conservative false discovery rate, we find over 1,000 significant differences in expression, or just under 1,000 significant differences in expression between forest and domestic colonies. Now, that's way too many to follow up on functionally, obviously. And also, these two uh, mosquito populations differ in many different ways, not just in their host preference. So many of these could be related to other phenotypes. Many of these differences could have randomly accumulated over time um, through which these two populations are not no longer exchanging uh, very many genes. So we needed a way to filter these 1,000 differences and identify those um, that are specifically and genetically linked to the difference in preference. And to do that, we used what's called a bulk segregant analysis. So you start off with a cross between uh, a forest colony and a domestic colony to create a large number of F1 hybrids. Then you mate F1 hybrids to each other to produce a large population of F2 hybrids. And in the F2s, um, each individual carries a unique combination of alleles from the two grandparents. So now we can use our olfactometer assay to identify F2s at the two ends of the behavioral spectrum, so those that strongly respond to humans, those that strongly respond to guinea pig. And now if we compare the genomes or the transcriptomes of these two groups of F2s, the only consistent differences we should see are differences in areas that either causally affect preference or are physically close along chromosomes to other, other changes that causally affect preference. Right, so the only differences we should see are differences that are genetically linked somehow 
to preference. So we conducted this bulk segregant analysis starting with um, a bulk cross between large numbers of mosquitoes from these two parent colonies, um, generating 2,000 F1s, and then um, about 5,000 F2s, of which half were female. We subsetted these 2,500 um, F2 females to identify about 150 that were most strongly and consistently attracted to human odor, and just over 100 that were strongly and consistently attracted to guinea pig odor. And in a single trial, when we compared the behavior of our final pools of F2 animals, we saw differences in preference, which seemed to reflect um, the extent and degree of difference between the two parent colonies. So here are the results um, from RNA-seq experiments on antennae from these two pools of F2s. This is, um, we have uh, no biological replication here, but we have technical replication. This is two different libraries um, generated from a single pool of F2 guinea pig preferring females or F2 human preferring females. And you can see, as expected, there's much less scatter away from the one-to-one -one line and many fewer significant differences. In this case, um, about 50. And there are only 14 genes that were expressed at significantly different levels, both consistently across multiple colonies and um, between F2 individuals generated from a cross between two colonies. So these 14 genes are our best candidates, and interestingly, two of these 14 genes were odorant receptors. So let me remi remind you that um, odorant receptors are olfactory receptors expressed in olfactory sensory neurons housed in these sensory hairs on the antennae and other olfactory organs of the mosquito. And olfactory receptors in insects come in two different flavors. We have a large, uh, large family of over 100 odorant receptors in mosquitoes and a smaller family of about 30 ionotropic receptors in mosquitoes that all function um, to detect odors. It's uh, with very few exceptions, um, both in insects and in mammals, an individual olfactory sensory neuron expresses just a single ligand selective receptor. And it's that receptor which determines which odors that's, that that population of sensory neurons will bind. Uh, and so our screen identified two odorant receptors, OR4 and OR103, that were associated with preference. And uh, one of the obvious next questions is, do they re recognize host odors? So we decided to follow up uh, first with OR4. And to determine whether it recognizes a host odor, uh, we created a transgenic fly which expresses OR4 in an identifiable neuron on the antenna which we can access for physiological recordings. We then teamed up with collaborators in Sweden to carry out a procedure called gas chromatography coupled single sensillum recording. And to make a long story very short, um, we identified a single fraction of human odor um, to which OR4 expressing neurons respond, and that fraction of human odor corresponds to a compound called sulcatone. We also found that sulcatone, although not at all specific to human odor, appears to be uh, more abundant in human odor than in the odor of many other animals, including guinea pigs, which have no sulcatone in their odor, um, and also horses, cows, sheep, and a bird, chicken. So this is by no way an exhaustive list, but at least in the animals that we've looked at, sulcatone seems to be much more abundant in human odor than in animal odor. So it is possible that mosquitoes are using this to distinguish us from other animals. Now, in our original RNA-seq analysis, um, where we found OR4 was more highly expressed in domestic human-preferring mosquitoes, we also noticed that domestic mosquitoes uh, tended to carry alleles of OR4 with altered coding sequences. So we cloned cDNA um, from the antennae of both the parent uh, forest and domestic colony and identified this diverse set of seven alleles, which differ in their protein sequences. This is a haplotype network based on protein sequences, shows the putative evolutionary relationships among these alleles. Um, here's a scale bar. This is five amino acid substitutions. So if you've looked at sort of natural variation within or even between populations um, in the past, you'll immediately recognize that this level of divergence is extreme, um, if not sort of unprecedented. It's sort of on the level of MHC uh, variation. 
in humans. So it's, it's really remarkable. On average, two alleles differ at 3% of their amino acid sites. Um, and typically, populations of a species would differ at fewer than 1% of silent sites, let alone coding sites or, or um, amino acid residues. So there's a lot of diversity, a surprising level of diversity among these seven alleles. Um, here you can see their relative frequency uh, in the two different parent colonies. So most of these alleles are specific to one or the other colony. There's a single allele here, A, which occurs in both. All seven alleles, as we would expect, were inherited by human and guinea pig preferring F2s. There are significant differences here, but they're um, quite subtle relative to the differences between parent colonies. Now, they become more interesting if we uh, illustrate them with a relative frequency index. So this will show you not the absolute frequency, but the degree to which each of these alleles was biased towards human preferring F2s or towards guinea pig preferring F2s. And you can see that all three alleles that characterize uh, the human preferring domestic parent are biased towards human preferring F2s. And three of the four alleles that um, were specific to the guinea pig preferring parent are biased towards guinea pig preferring F2s. So that suggests that there's something about these different um, coding alleles which also affects preference. And one obvious hypothesis is that they differ in their sensitivity to sulcatone. So we tested that by taking all seven alleles and putting them individually into flies um, and recording from OR4 expressing neurons while, while um, exposing the fly to different doses of sulcatone. So in this way, we get dose response curves um, for each allele. These four alleles had similar sensitivities um, to sulcatone. Allele G, specific to the domestic colony, was more sensitive, slightly, but significantly more sensitive. And the D and E alleles were uh, much less sensitive, really not sensitive at all at physiologically um, relevant concentrations. Uh, for example, at 10 to the minus 4, um, these differences are highly significant. So, so yes, each of these alleles does have its own characteristic sensitivity to sulcatone. If these differences in sensitivity is what is causing um, any individual allele to be biased towards human preferring or guinea pig preferring F2 mosquitoes, we should be able to use an allele sensitivity to predict its relative frequency in F2s, right? And we should see um, a, positive, a positive relationship with the most sensitive alleles being biased towards human preferring mosquitoes and the least sensitive alleles being biased towards guinea pig preferring mosquitoes. Now, we do see a positive relationship. Um, admittedly, the sample size with just seven alleles is quite small and it's marginally significant. Um, it's a little noisy. For example, allele F here is highly sensitive to sulcatone, but biased towards guinea pig preferring F2s. So we wondered if we could get rid of some of this noise, if we were missing part of the picture, um, and if that part of the picture was actually allele-specific expression. Right, so we know OR4 is upregulated in human preferring mosquitoes. That was, that was based on an analysis that did not differentiate between alleles. What if it's the case that each of these alleles has not only its own characteristic sensitivity to sulcatone, but also its own characteristic level of expression uh, based, for example, on linked changes in regulatory regions? So we went back to our, F2, uh, our F2 RNA-seq data, reanalyzed it, this time parsing reads by the individual allele to which they correspond, and dividing um, expression of each allele in each pool of F2s by the frequency of that allele in the genomes of those F2 individuals. So, so this gives us an estimate of allele-specific expression. And it's similar to asking, uh, at what level was the B allele expressed in human preferring F2s? Or at what level was the F allele expressed in these F2s? How about in guinea pig preferring F2s? So here are the data for all seven alleles. And probably what jumps out at you right away is that regardless of what allele an F2 mosquito expresses or carries in its genome, expression of OR4 in human preferring um, F2s was always higher than the expression of OR4 in guinea pig preferring F2s. And this indicates that a genetic factor unlinked to OR4 contributes to the upregulation of this gene in human preferring mosquitoes, right? Because for each of these lines, we're comparing two groups of mosquitoes that carry the exact same piece of DNA at the OR4 locus, inherited from the same grandparent. Um, so whatever's causing this consistent difference um, must be far enough away from OR4 that became unlinked during recombination in F2s. Right, so we think that this is some trans factor. 
Now, you also may notice that the rank or order of expression of these alleles in the two groups is maintained. That's also highly significant. And this is the original pattern we suspected. Maybe each of these alleles has their own characteristic um, level of expression, regardless of the genetic background, regardless of whether they're expressed in human preferring F2s or in guinea pig preferring F2s. And that, that is true. B is always expressed at the highest level, F is always expressed at the lowest level. In fact, none of these lines cross. It's a very consistent um, difference. So now if we go back to this um, suggestive but not quite significant relationship between sensitivity to sulcatone and the frequency index, we can add in each allele's specific expression, and the relationship becomes incredibly tight. So if we know an allele's sensitivity to sulcatone and the level at which, it, at which it's expressed, we can exactly and precisely predict its relative frequency in human preferring F2s. Each of those factors contributed significantly to the overall effect and it had what still astounds me, um, an R square value of 0 0.92, which in behavioral analysis um, one almost never sees. So um, it's a very strong relationship and if we think back to the previous analysis, allele F here is the one that stood out. It was highly sensitive to sulcatone, but biased towards guinea pig referring F2s. Now we can explain that by the fact that its expression level here is extremely low. So it's no good. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have a highly sensitive allele if it's hardly expressed. So this analysis leads um, to an obvious hypothesis, which is that sulcatone is highly abundant in human odor. It was attractive even to the ancestor of domestic mosquitoes but then an increase in sensitivity to this compound through changes at the OR4 locus and some trans factor um, have increased preference for humans by increasing sensitivity to this compound. Now, the problem, one problem with this hypothesis is that the only thing we knew about sulcatone and mosquitoes previously from the literature was that it was thought to be a repellent. Um, now, admittedly, I would say that the data on that are not very strong, but there was even a, somewhat of a backlash from the mosquito community um, when this work was published, saying, obviously, you guys are wrong because sulcatone is the repellent. Um, and I would say that that doesn't make us wrong, but it makes the story potentially more interesting. So an alternative hypothesis is that sulcatone is strongly repellent to ancestral mosquitoes, and that that behavioral response is mediated by other odor receptors, and that increased signaling through OR4 actually helps to overcome ancestral aversion. So these are hypotheses that um, a current postdoc in the lab um, named Sarah McGuire is testing, and she's used CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out OR4 in this mosquito, um, and also label OR4-expressing neurons, and is trying to do a series of behavioral experiments that will help us differentiate between these two hypotheses. Now, in addition to OR4, um, there is one other fantastic odor receptor candidate um, it came out of our RNA-seq analysis, OR103, and a student in the lab, Jessica Zung, is beginning to follow up um, on this odorant receptor. So far, she's cloned not seven, but just three, um, still extremely divergent alleles from the two parent colonies. And interestingly, in this case, one of the two dominant alleles from domestic mosquitoes has a four-base pair frame-shifting deletion and is almost certainly non-functional. So we don't think that this is a case where domestic mosquitoes um, carry more sensitive alleles um, of this receptor. If anything, we would expect the forest allele to be functional, and perhaps this huge level of protein divergence and this frame-shifting mutation destroy ancestral function at this receptor in domestic mosquitoes. So maybe this receptor actually directly responds to an aversive compound, and um, knock, effectively knocking it out in forest mosquitoes was um, a key step in overcoming aversion to humans. That's highly speculative at the moment, but that's a working hypothesis, and we'll now um, put this forest allele into flies and determine whether it responds to uh, a human or guinea pig odorant. Now, in addition to these two ORs, there were a handful of other um, relatively unknown, either completely unknown or um, uh, relatively unknown antennal genes that came up in our RNA-seq expression. And, RNA-seq screen, and in general, we expect this change in behavior to be due to changes at multiple loci, not just OR4, not just OR4 and OR103. What we know about evolution and what we know about olfaction suggests that this will be um, at least a handful of genetic changes, um, and, and we have evidence for that at the periphery. So another thing we'd like to do is immediately get a global sense 
for how much has changed at the periphery and um, what subset of those changes are actually linked to preference. And to do that, we think that um, the best thing is to look at the first synapse in the brain in the antenna lobe. This structure is um, homologous to the olfactory bulb in vertebrates, and it has a very useful structure for our purpose. So it's made up of spherical neuropil um, called glomeruli, and each glomerulus represents synapses between a single population of olfactory sensory neurons and a single population of projection neurons. So um, all sensory neurons, this is true both in insects and in vertebrates, all sensory neurons that express the same receptor project to the exact same glomerulus. So for example, sensory neurons that express OR4 will project to this OR4 glomerulus. Sensory neurons that express OR103 will project to a separate OR103-specific glomerulus, and so on. So by imaging activity in this area of the brain, we immediately have a way to assess the relative responses of each of these channels, so to speak, each of those receptor-specific um, sensory neuron populations to host odorants. So we're in the process of creating a mosquito that expresses GCAMP6S in olfactory sensory neurons, and um, we'll do this in both human and animal-preferring mosquitoes, and then compare odor-evoked activity uh, between these two types of mosquitoes when exposed to individual host odorants and also host odor blends. We can also get an immediate sense for potential differences in the number of neurons that express, express each receptor by comparing the size of these different glomeruli. For example, we suspect that the increase in expression of OR4 is at least partly due to an increase in the number of OR4 expressing neurons. And if that's true, we would express the OR4 glomerulus to be larger, um, actually the opposite, to be larger in human-preferring mosquitoes and smaller in animal-preferring mosquitoes. Um, so a student in the lab, a fantastic student named Gilles Zhao, is in the process of creating these GCAMP success mosquitoes, and I expect that within about uh, six months to a year, um, we'll be able to start looking at odor-evoked activity in the brain. And that will be the first step also in trying to understand, um, which to me is, is even more fascinating than potential changes at the periphery, how have olfactory circuits in the central brain evolved to change the percept of uh, a host to this mosquito. Now, we don't know for sure that there have been any changes in central areas, but um, we think there may be. We're very interested in finding out if there are. And even if there aren't, we think that this is a great model for understanding um, the processing of innately important olfactory odors um, or olfactory stimuli in insects because this response is very blend-specific. Mosquitoes don't respond to individual human odorants. They only respond to the blend. Um, and so uh, we're hoping that we can find out something just in general about olfactory processing um, as well as how olfactory processing evolves. Now I'm going to end um, just with three slides telling you about a new project that we're starting in the lab which doesn't have anything to do with behavior really but um, I'm pretty excited about. And that is the physiological basis of the itch or pain you feel when you're bitten by a mosquito bite. Interestingly, we know very little about this. I know there is evidence that there is histamine-based response, that part of the itch and pain you feel when a mosquito bites you is caused by your own immune response to saliva released um, under your skin. But there may also be a direct, um, res uh, a direct neural response um, to that saliva. There is no response. I mean, if you fed a lot of mosquitoes, as I have, um, you will know that you don't actually feel the proboscis of mosquito entering your skin. You feel nothing when they probe your skin. They have their mouth parts actually, uh, I think I have a slide for this, um, have many different parts. So what you see as the proboscis of mosquito is actually this sheath which pulls back as the inner sort of tube enters your skin. And uh, in addition to a tube through which blood is removed, there are all these mouth parts um, that, for example, saw and are very sharp and so can, can allow the mosquito to probe your skin and identify a blood vessel without you feeling anything. When you feel a response, it's actually about a minute after a mosquito has started to bite, um, and presumably that's the amount of time it takes for uh, the immune system to respond or for there to be enough saliva under your skin um, for it to trigger an itch response. So what I noticed initially when feeding these mosquitoes in the lab and what now a postdoc in my lab um, named Hilary Metz has documented 
um, definitively is that the bites of domestic mosquitoes are significantly less itchy or painful than the bites of forest mosquitoes. And you would expect that to be highly adaptive. The mosquito wants to go unnoticed. It doesn't want to be killed, especially if you're a mosquito that specializes in biting humans, since we're really quite good at killing mosquitoes. Um, so we would expect this trait to be under strong selection and therefore perhaps have a fairly simple genetic basis. And so we're going to try to map these differences and identify what we expect may be differences in the salivary composition, composition of the saliva of these two different types of mosquitoes um, that causes their itches to cause different amounts, their bites to cause different amounts of itch. And we expect this may also tell us something about um, uh, the nature of the itch and pain response in humans and, Itch and pain in invertebrates is a relatively unknown uh, sense. So we're hoping that that will also be um, highly interesting. So with that, I'd like to thank um, my lab. Uh, in particular, Sarah McGuire is carrying on studies of OR4, um, creating a knockout mutant and trying to differentiate between the hypotheses by which we think OR4 may affect preference. Jilei Zhao is pioneering uh, antenna lobe imaging uh, in these two different types of mosquitoes, and Hilary Metz is studying the physiological basis of itch and pain. Um, I'll also um, acknowledge uh, my supportive and fantastic postdoc mentor, Leslie Vossall, and several other people who contributed to this original work that I carried out as a postdoc and several different sources of funding. So, thank you.